So I'm very glad to uh, have this opportunity to introduce uh, Lisa Stein, who's, who's the object of our conversation today. Um, in a way, I'm glad to do this because a few weeks ago, Lisa introduced me, so now I can get <laughs> the opportunity for revenge. <laughs> um, let me start, though, by saying that um, I first encountered Lisa Steiner when she came to my lab, uh, then in St. Louis at Washington University School of Medicine, uh, to be a postdoc in the lab. She had come from uh, Yale University Medical School, where she had run up a sterling performance, and came um, with, or sh was shortly obtained uh, there after coming, a Helen Hay Whitney Foundation Fellowship, very prestigious one, as you know. Uh, and she came to the lab um, at a very propitious time. It was at a time shortly after uh, we were able to use a, uh, develop a, with Sidney Vellick, a novel way of rapidly measuring the affinity of antibodies for small antigen surrogates called haptins. Um, using a form of energy transfer that's now called, what, FRET, and um, had been able to demonstrate that the changing properties of antisera after animals or people were immunized with an antigen, those changing properties in the way of becoming the, um, making the antibodies more effectively reactive with the antigen was actually due to a change in the intrinsic affinity of the antibodies for their uh, epitopes or haptins or antigenic determinants that increased with time after the antigen was given. Uh, that was all very nice, and that change was seen when the antigen dose was small, but not if the antigen dose was large. If it was large, the affinities didn't change for many, many weeks. If it was small, there could be a thousand-fold increase in affinity in a couple of weeks. Uh, that observation um, attracted considerable attention because at the time there was still a big debate as to whether antibodies were being uh, made by cells that were selected by the antigen, reacting with, with uh, lymphocytes that already were making the appropriate antibody, but the antigen selected those that could bind to the antigen and stimulate the production of the corresponding antibody. Or the alternative hypothesis, which had been in place for maybe uh, 15, 20 years, that antigens acted as templates around which uh, a nascent antibody molecule would fold and acquire a complementary shape. The kind of hypothesis that Linus Pauling put his imprimatur on and gave very a lot of uh, cachet to. Um, that hypothesis was um, on, his, on his last legs, I would say, when Burnett advanced the clonal hypothesis, which is what I was referring to before by the antigen acting to select clones of cells that were making the corresponding antibody. Well, when Lisa, the, the observation I was talking about, about the changing affinity with time, with small doses of antigen, but not large, uh, could be explained by either hypothesis, actually. Um, according to the clonal selection hypothesis, small doses of antigens would preferentially react with the clones that are making the uh, displaying the high affinity antibodies and stimulating them to make those high affinity antibodies. And as the antigen dose declined with time, there'd be more and more preferential stimulation of the high affinity producing cells. Alternatively, one could say that high doses of antigen um, initially, or for lasting a long time after injecting a lot of antigen, would preferentially bind high affinity antibody molecules in populations which are not, were not changing with time. And those would be eliminated by the, phag by the complexes being phagocytized and disposed of, leaving behind the lower affinity population uh, to persist for a long time uh, when the antigen dose was high. Well, the only way to resolve that dilemma was by looking at the cells themselves rather than the serum antibodies. And when Lisa came to the lab, she devised this very uh, elegant way for measuring the affinity of antibodies that were produced by cells that were isolated from animals at different times after the antigen was given, and incubating those cells with labeled, radial labeled amino acids, uh, and then using carrier antibodies of known affinity 
co-precipitating them and being able to work out the affinity of those traces of antibody that were made by isolated cells. It sounds in a way sort of trivial at the time now, but at the time, just being able to keep cells in culture long enough to take up radioactive amino acids and incorporate them into an antibody that was secreted that you could deal with was um, not insignificant. Uh, just before that, antibody production in outside of an animal can only be looked at with slices of uh, spleens or slices of lymph nodes. Anyway, after that um, elegant work that she did as a postdoc, uh, Lisa moved to a second postdoc in Oxford uh, to Rod Porter's lab. They were also at a very propitious time because at about that time, um, in Porter's lab, Julian Fleischmann, who's here with Betty Press, and Rod Porter had just about published a paper that um, really clarified for the first time the structure of the antibody molecule, <coughs> showing that there were variable domains that could bind antigen, that there were invariable constant domains that could be actually crystallized, uh, and, then the, and also the four-chain structure of the antibody molecules. Uh, Lisa, in going there, found a milieu that was just suitable for her temperament, which was to be, uh, I would put, uh, uh, sort of intolerant of ambiguities. <laughs> she liked precision, and she was able to engage there in this um, further work on the structure of antibodies. And it was uh, after only a couple of years there that she was recruited uh, to MIT uh, by uh, Jack Buchanan, who uh, sadly died a couple of weeks ago. But Jack then is, um, was uh, head of the biochemistry division, which existed in the biology department at the time, um, was looking for an immunologist and uh, turned to Rod Porter for help. And uh, uh, Rod strongly supported Lisa for that position. And so she came here. Here she is <laughs> and remains. 40 years later, I might add. <laughs> uh, <Just> unchanged. <laughs> Uh, and so I think at this point we'll see. Before I go on, let me just say one thing about Lisa. Uh, Lisa, uh, <laughs> one more thing. I mean, I <laughs> I'm going to take some of this back. Um, Lisa has an uncanny knack for finding flaws in arguments. When I have a paper that I really want to look at carefully because I have some doubts about it, I'll send it to Lisa with some trepidation. And she will usually find something that's a little bit wrong with it. So uh, for that, I both annoyed and, and grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, OK, Lisa, you take I it. I guess I'll thank you anyway, Herman, for that. <laughs> um, uh, I'll take off, uh, I guess, on some of the points that Leonard made a, a few weeks ago. In fact, I, I've never been videotaped before in my life. And this is happening for the second time in a month. Uh, the previous t occasion was at the other end of this hall. The Helen Hay Whitney Foundation is having its 50th anniversary uh, next November. And uh, for this occasion, they decided to uh, videotape some of the people who've been associated with the foundation. And as Herman mentioned, I had a fellowship from them. And uh, for about the last um, 20, 25 years, I've been a trustee of the foundation. And uh, many of our faculty in the department and, and postdocs as well have had uh, uh, fellowships from the Whitney Foundation. When I first started as a trustee, I met Chris Kaiser, who was a fellow, having known him when he was here as a graduate student. And he was, at that time, uh, out on the West Coast, but had uh, one of the fellowships. And there were a number of other faculty members who had this fellowship. Um, oh, and uh, so they videotaped uh, me as well for that occasion. Um, at about the same time, for the uh, for the foundation, they, before this videotaping occurred, they wanted a short biography from me. And I sat at my computer. I didn't have much time. And I thought about what to say. And, and the, the thing that occurred to me the most was how, how fortunate I had been in my life. As it happened, the day that I was writing was practically the sixth anniversary of the day that my mother died at a rather advanced age. And I thought that my good fortune in life had really, uh, I owed, uh, to her, first of all, because she had the foresight when I was a very young child to recognize that um, uh, Austria and Vienna was not a good place for uh, a Jewish family to remain after Hitler occupied um, 
uh, occupied it in 1938, and she, against uh, some advice really from other people, decided that she absolutely had to leave, and she took her two children, my brother and myself, and we eventually made our way. We were fortunate again to get visas to come to the United States, so that my, literally I owe her my, my life. Um, but there have been lots of other uh, good fortunes. Um, I uh, uh, just fast tracking forward. I had the good fortune as uh, after I finished my medical studies to decide to. Uh, I thought at the time that I'd probably go into academic medicine, and uh, the general thought was that you should get some good, sound, basic training in, in one field or another, and. Uh, I had always been interested in immunology since taking it as a medical student. I was just fascinated with the idea that the, the, the body can respond to all these antigens and somehow not respond to self, usually. And how did, it, how did this work? At that time, the genetics, of course, was completely unknown. The proteins were everything was unknown. But I thought it was a fascinating problem. And uh, so I decided to go into uh, to get a postdoc in immunology, and then I had the uh, exceeding good fortune to have two wonderful postdoc advisors, Herman Eisen, who then followed me to MIT, <laughs> uh, and uh, Rodney Porter, uh, who was actually, we were in London at the time, but the uh, small detail. Um, and both of those uh, experiences were fantastic, and uh, I also uh, remained uh, very good friends with Herman to this day and with Rod Porter until his uh, unfortunate death in a car accident some 20 years ago now. Um, so I, I feel I've been, and I was certainly in the right place at the right time uh, to get the position at MIT, which is another uh, stroke of good fortune, really. So um, having said that, uh, I think I'll adopt Gene's method. Uh, the, the one other thing I want to say, just looking around the audience, uh, it's very nice to see people like Herman, who I think I have known the longest of anybody in this audience, uh, Julian almost as long, uh, and one of my freshman advisees from last <coughs> semester who's dropped by. Uh, I had a wonderful group of freshman advisees. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. He's from Singapore. And uh, it really was a lot of, we had a lot of fun together for our seminar, which was on um, current advances in medicine, essentially, more or less. Uh, but it was a, a great group. So uh, I, I'll now respond to questions or any, anything else anybody wants to ask me, as Gene did. He said, ask me something. So Gene is going to rise to the occasion. <laughs> yeah. So I understand it. Yeah. you were a math major yeah. in college. Yeah. How in the world yeah. did a math major yeah. get, uh, decide to go to medical school? Well, that's, an, that's a good question, actually. And I was actually thinking, as Gene was talking, how different our two uh, career paths have been. And because I bounced all over the place uh, before I finally settled. Uh, and uh, that's something I often tell students as well, that even if you don't know exactly what you want to do, uh, if you're persistent, you can change your mind. And, the, and life has a number of branch points, and you're not committed. Uh, uh, so I certainly had branch points. Um, I would say through my uh, early years, high school and into college, I loved mathematics. I thought Euclidean geometry was the best thing that, you know, that uh, man had ever devised. Uh, I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was. You just had a bunch of postulates, and then you could uh, uh, prove almost anything. And I remember also being treated by the scientific method. You know, you make a hypothesis and you test it. But I used to stand around. You know, I'd make all sorts of hypotheses, and then I'd have no idea how to test them. That was the <laughs> problem with that. <laughs> But I just really, I liked science in general. And, and, um, and I was also very, there was another part of my good fortune, which I put into this short one-page biography. I went to a big public high school in New York City, um, which had just opened. It was at Forest Hills High School. And uh, there were several aspects of that school that were very good. One was that the, many of the teachers were products of the uh, city colleges, um, City College, Queens College, other of the city colleges. And they had gone through these colleges during the Depression in the 30s and had gone into teaching because it was difficult, uh, because of financial pressures, I think, for them to go on and, and uh, perhaps get PhDs or in higher education. 
So that we really had a fantastic group of, of uh, teachers, and, they, and any student who was interested, they really encouraged. And the, the students, there were also a lot of very bright students. Many of them came from refugee families like my own, where learning and, uh, was rather valued. Um, although I, I must say, sometimes I, I think back, my, my mother, um, if I came home with all A's or, or very good marks, which I usually did, she didn't like that. She, she said, you should get a B, because life is not all A's. You're not being adequately prepared for life. <laughs> <laughs> so it's rather, rather different from many families, I think. Uh, but so I had lots of uh, stimulation and opportunity in high school. And uh, I just loved math. I took four years of math and four years of science. And uh, in fact, I couldn't fit it all into my program because I was also playing in the school orchestra. And I, you know, that, I did that during lunch hour. And it was hard to squeeze everything in because I was interested in everything. And I, I went to a summer camp one year, and I sat on my bed in rest hour studying solid geometry because I wanted to take the exam and I couldn't fit it into my program. So I wanted to take the Regents exam in solid geometry so I could get my full four years of math. So I went on in a college and I continued to major in math, which I continued to enjoy no end. And it wasn't really till my senior year that I began to think about what I might do later. And uh, then I, and I did begin to think about medicine, I, I think for the reasons many of my pre-med advisees often give, that uh, you, know, you know someone who's sick and you realize how helpless, how little you know, and you'd like to help people. But I, I couldn't decide, but I, I then decided to uh, go to graduate school in math. It seemed like the most straightforward extension of what I was doing. And uh, another sort of thing that's amusing in retrospect is the, the best math department uh, in the country, I think, at that time, maybe still, was at Princeton. And uh, various of the math majors that I had known and I was friendly with at, at, uh, in college had gone to Princeton Graduate School. But Princeton didn't take women uh, in either undergraduate or graduate in those days. And the interesting thing is I didn't, you know, I knew it, it, was, uh, it bothered me a very small amount, and I shrugged my sh shoulders and said, oh, well, uh, I'll go to Harvard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Second best. <laughs> so I did that. Uh, uh, I came up here, my first experience in Cambridge. The skyline was very different then. The only tall building in Boston was the, uh, the Custom Tower, really. Maybe the old Prudential, perhaps, but... Uh, Boston was certainly a different city, and I took, I had, had such good, I went to Swarthmore College where I had uh, very good uh, 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 classes in math. So I actually sort of ran out of things I could take in my first year at Harvard, and I, I came down to MIT to take topology, and I used to bicycle down uh, from Harvard th through the back there, where now with all this biotech, at the, that time it was all old factories. Uh, the area has just changed completely beyond recognition. And I did that, but midway through that year, I, I was feeling a little lost. I didn't know what I would do further. Uh, I didn't think I was really going to be a great mathematician. Um, I didn't really know, actually, because in math, you're, in contrast to biology, as a student, even uh, taking fairly advanced classes, you're very far from the frontier, and it's a little hard to imagine what, what actually doing creative work in mathematics might be. So my thoughts sort of, and I probably was suffering a little bit from the kind of dislocation that you have the first year after college. Everything's been very programmed and you, you know, life has been contained and now you're faced with the big world and having to make decisions. So I began to think again a, a, about going to medical school and uh, I decided to apply um, uh, in the middle of the year actually. And uh, so I ended up then going to medical school the next year, but very anxious about it and very uncertain I was doing the right thing because I had certainly not wanted to be a doctor from my earliest days. Uh, I went to Yale Medical School uh, because I thought it was the least like a medical school of any school that I knew about. Uh, you had to do a research, you had to do a thesis, you had no exams. I was kind of like that kind of uh, low pressure approach. And uh, I liked the medical school very much actually and I found uh, medicine, all aspects, was, it was interesting. Anatomy was interesting, everything was interesting. Uh, and uh, seeing patients was a challenge. But again, I didn't, for quite a while, wasn't really sure what I'd do later on. And then I, uh, I had enjoyed, I had a very, another fortunate thing was I, due to uh, 
the suggestion of uh, someone who's quite a famous scientist now was uh, I knew from college who was doing uh, biochemistry graduate work at MIT, Maxine Singer, uh, with Joe Fruton, actually, who was a, a pillar of biochemistry who I understand is very ill right, right now. Um, but anyway, she suggested I work with Fred Richards, who had just arrived at Yale. Uh, and she said he was building all sorts of machinery, and I'd have to do very little in his lab. <laughs> so I did go to work there and discovered he was building an amino acid analyzer just after it had been dis described by Stein and Moore uh, at the Rockefeller. And, uh, but it, it did turn out that it didn't really do everything. <laughs> uh, but that was, and I worked with Fred all through, um, through my medical school years, summers, and that was a very fortunate uh, uh, experience because he's a wonderful scientist. Um, and then uh, I decided to get more research experience, and I applied for the Whitney Foundation Fellowship to work uh, in immunology. Herman had visited uh, at, uh, at uh, Yale, and I, I was telling him recently the first time I wrote to him, I just wrote, and I didn't say anything about my background, really. I just said I was interested in a postdoc, and I assumed that he'd say, of course, come. <laughs> well, he didn't say that. <laughs> I'm not sure he replied. I don't really quite remember. And then I decided I'd better write him again and uh, give him a little bit of information about my background, and I think then he relented. Um, so, uh, so that was very, very good experience. I spent the first summer in Israel at the Weizmann Institute because Herman was spending the summer in Woods Hole, and he had written me and said, "Did I mind not coming to St. Louis for July and August?" And I thought, <laughs> I thought that was a good idea. So I looked around for another place to go, and I went to the Weizmann Institute and had a very interesting time there, and then appeared in St. Louis in the fall. So anyway. Uh, so that just illustrates that one can zig and zag. I, 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 I sometimes think, of course, what would have happened to me if I had not gone to medical school? Well, I'm pretty sure I would have ended up teaching math at you know, Wellesley or someplace like that. Uh, and it wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have been bad. Uh, but uh, I don't regret. I don't, people often ask if I'm glad I went to medical school. Well, I'm not glad in the sense that it, it's not most of it really isn't directly useful, except in, in helping your family and friends when they get sick. Uh, but uh, medical school is a very interesting experience. It's somewhat like traveling. Uh, you see a lot of life. You see a slice of life that you would in an emergency room at 2 AM that you would never see uh, if you're in academia, strictly. And I've, that was, you know, uh, I don't think if you know that you don't want to treat patients, it's probably not a good idea to go to medical school. It's too, uh, but, Nevertheless, I, I don't feel it was a loss by any means. Um, you, yes, when Boris. You, the normal thing is to get an internship yeah. residency. Yeah. So did you start? Yes, I did. I, I took an internship. Uh, I was an intern at Yale and um, uh, in the internal medicine. And I had an interesting exchange with, with Herman when I first got to know him because uh, I found the internship extremely difficult. In those days, uh, it was every other night on, every other weekend on. So you would be on, for example, thurs Thursday morning through Saturday afternoon without, without interruption, uh, or an entire weekend through Monday night. And it was uh, physically exhausting, and it was emotionally exhausting, because you're dealing with very sick people, many of whom you cannot help, and uh, no matter what you do, and you know that. And, and furthermore, um, you will be up all night taking care of them. And uh, I, you, the thing that really got me was that I, after a weekend off, this every other week, I would just spend you know, most of it sleeping. And then I'd come back on Monday, and I'd look at the chart rack. And I knew that I had certain patients who were not going to survive. They were typically people who were bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract, which is the end stage of alcoholism. And there's, no, there's still no way to rescue people with that. You can operate, but they, they always eventually die. But when they're still alive, you're, you have to transfuse them constantly, and they require an enormous amount of care. So I'd look at the rack, and I'd see if a patient who I knew, if they were still alive, would keep me up for the rest of the week. And if they were not there, that means they died on the other person's shift, then I would be relieved. I couldn't deal with that. I thought it was just awful to feel that way. It was just self 
preserving instinct, but I just, I just had difficulty, and I worried enough about the patients that I, I could see that my, my other fellow interns, and it's a very tight group, it's like being in the military, I think you're sort of through this very stressful experience helping each other sometimes. You find out who will help and who will not help. But uh, I just uh, found it emotionally, really, and, uh, more difficult than the physical part. And uh, so many of the patients had chronic illnesses, and you really couldn't help them. Um, uh, and the other interns who were a little bit more removed uh, could just leave and not worry about it. And I'd hang around <laughs> thinking I should be doing something and getting totally exhausted. And so at the end, I think I was really less effective than to be a good doctor. You have to care about your patients, but you have to maintain a bit of distance and not, not get too, too concerned about them. I did that for one year, and then I, uh, I was asked if I wanted to continue a residency in internal medicine, but uh, the decision had to be made in like October for the next July. In October, I didn't think I was going to survive uh, so the year, so I, what was the point of signing up for something different? So I didn't, and then I looked around at the end of the year, and I decided to, uh, I was offered a, a position in doing combination research and clinical work in dermatology at Yale, there was a very fine dermatologist who was also a biochemist, and Herman and I went to a memorial service for him uh, just last week on Monday in Woods Hole. Um, who, he died a bit before that. And I thought that that would be, since I was interested in biochemistry, that that would be an interesting way. And, and dermatology, you know, the patients weren't too sick. Uh, <laughs> but but the, other, the other side of it was I just didn't find it that interesting. <laughs> it was just looking at a lot of rashes. <laughs> and uh, at that, uh, dermatology has become a lot more interesting now. A lot of the scientific basis for it now is instead. But in those days, it was mostly a matter of just remembering a vast array of appearances of people's skins and being able to pull out. A, that's the other thing about medicine. It's really a good doctor, a good internist, or is not really, you don't really go through deductive reasoning, sort of Sherlock Holmes style, who was a doctor, of course. But it's more a matter of remembering that you saw somebody five years earlier with this particular combination of symptoms. And uh, this is really a quite extreme in, in a field like dermatology. So, but when I did go to St. Louis in immunology, I thought I would probably end up uh, in academic medicine in a department of medicine. But then after I finished uh, three years in St. Louis, two years in London, I then I was in contact with the, who, the person who was then chair of medicine at Yale, and I think they were, you know, he asked me if I'd be interested in going there, and he said, you only have to see patients, you know, one month a year or two months a year. But then I thought, well, to see patients one month a year, even one week a year, <laughs> you've got to be up on, on clinical medicine. And I remember as a house officer that most of the academic people, Yale had a full-time academic staff in medicine, most of them were not very helpful because the, the practical details, which are many of them arbitrary, you know, after a heart attack, when can the patient get out of bed? Well, it's completely, that's completely changed, so it's obvious it's really arbitrary. Nobody really knows. But you needed some guidelines, and it was really the, the practicing doctors in New Haven who would come in also, who told you sort of, at least gave you an idea of what was reasonable to do. So I thought that. Uh, and then you have to figure out what kind of a person you are. And I knew that I would not be good at just, uh, you know, as the hedgehog and the fox. Uh, I, I was, I guess, a hedgehog. I could, I would do better knowing a lot about a little than uh, knowing enough about medicine to do that. And but there are some people who have the ability to put it all together, and uh, they can make great contributions. I think in the case of somebody, if you can combine your clinical interests with your research interests, it can be very productive. But uh, I didn't think I myself could do that, so I decided I had to choose, and I chose the research. Yeah. Did you choose the re doing research in biological sciences mm -hmm. because you thought that would have an influence on medicine, or was it simply it was an academic pursuit that was interesting to you? Oh, hard to answer that. I, 
I mean, of the, th of the areas in biology that I was familiar with, as, uh, which I learned in medical school, I had really hadn't, I had minored in biology because I always was interested. I always liked the procedures of math, the logic and so on, but I found the questions in biology interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think I was attracted to immunology because, of, and in fact, I was attracted to Herman's research. Uh, of course, when I was thinking about where to go, I looked up a lot of papers and Pete different went around, uh, had interviews and so on. And what attracted me about Herman's research in delayed hypersensitivity, which he talked about a few weeks ago, was that he was applying very uh, scientific methods to uh, an important clinical problem. And that, I found that rather unusual, but it was the idea that of applying basic science to a clinical problem that I found attractive. Now, I didn't know exactly where in the spectrum I would end up with. And I, in fact, I've ended up doing research that's pretty far removed from clinical things. But I en enjoy teaching immunology in part because because it does have, uh, in the teaching, it does have clinical applications. and it. Uh, interest students who um, are interested in, in medicine. Um. So Herman mentioned that you had an uncanny ability to pick out the tiniest <laughs> flaws and arguments. <laughs> so do you think your mathematical training helped you in yeah. getting that? I was just having this conversation, a similar conversation. That's an interesting question with Herman as we were driving back from Woods Hole. I've never had. Uh, I don't think, uh, I've never had the feeling that I learned how to do science in any particular place. I mean, yes, I learned some things, but the basic ideas of how to do an experiment, what a control is, uh, I just feel I always knew those things. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't sort of learn it at any, I mean, I learned a lot of things from her and from Rod Porter, but I didn't learn somehow the logic of, of I don't know where I learned that. Uh, and. Um, with math, I think I don't think I learned to be logical because of the math. I think I was attracted to math because my mind works logically. Now that's not always an advantage. I mean, I'm very slow in writing papers, as the people who <laughs> in my lab have <laughs> suffered with, because I always see the flaws uh, in, in in them, uh, and so it's not. Uh, so that's and then you can it can be inhibiting in terms of research if you uh, you know if you think too much about why things won't work you may be more reluctant to and I always have even now have great difficulty when things are arbitrary I was recently trying to design a, a take a pep try to make antibodies and and look at a peptide and a protein which would be the best there are a zillion programs there are a zillion rules. And you, get, you come up, the decision is arbitrary. You know, should it be 15 residues, which is cheaper than 20 residues? Should it be the C-terminal part or which part? And there's no, there's really no best way to do it. And it kind of paralyzes me, uh, which is not a, not a good thing if you're doing research. Um, because I just, and it was the same problem in medicine. I just didn't, in dermatology, a patient came in and they had something and you gave them three different things, something by mouth, something to, smear on and wet, wet cloths to put on. They got better the next week. You didn't know why, which one, you know? <laughs> and all of that bothered me. So I think by temperament, I'm probably better suited to do mathematics than to do experimental science, where things are always a bit uncertain. Be that, that's my own, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Stop tracking a little bit. Um, it, clearly, you're really well prepared in high school, and you could have gone to any of a variety of yeah. colleges. So yeah. Why Swarthmore? And to what extent have you felt discrimination as a woman? Yeah. Yourself? Well, I'm glad you asked both those questions. Um, why Swarthmore? Well, part of it was, uh, you know, I was in high school at Forest Hills, and you saw what the people who were valedictorians of the previous classes had done and they tended to go to Swarthmore. In fact, the, the previous year, somebody who had been, I think, first or second in the class had not gone into Swarthmore and had gotten into Radcliffe. So it was, and I was a very good friend of uh, uh, Ursula, Victor, and Sandra uh, in high school, and we were both finalists in this Westinghouse science talent search. We went to Washington, it was a big thrill. Heard Oppenheimer give a talk. Uh, 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 in fact, there are, there are a couple of Nobel laureates in our group. Um, uh, 
But anyway, so uh, she went to Swarthmore. So that was one of the places, you know. So I applied there. I also applied to Radcliffe. And then I came up and had interviews in both places. And um, the Swarthmore campus, this was in the spring, is gorgeous. Uh, I was recently out in Wellesley, um, and I walked around the lake. And Wellesley is just a beautiful, beautiful campus. And Swarthmore, I was, had grown up in New York, and I really had uh, I'd been in the country a little bit, but I just, uh, you know, the daffodils in the spring and the greenery, and it looked just like a college campus. It was peaceful. There were woods next to it. Then I came to Harvard Square, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just put off. Uh, uh, and then I, I was, um, and then I, I got a very good scholarship, which I needed at Swarthmore. And so I said, well, why not? Um, uh, discrimination. Um, I did also, I went to Yale Medical School. I got into Harvard, but I, again, it was because Yale, I thought, was less like a medical school. And various people told me I was crazy that I was turning down the best medical school. And I had also, after a year at Harvard, I wanted to get away from, <laughs> from being, you know, Harvard being the best. It just grated on me slightly. So I went to second best. <laughs> so I, uh, there are many, as I also tell my pre-med advisees, there are many fine medical s schools. Uh, Wash U is a great medical school in Yale and Hopkins, and there's no, you know, you make, you make, if you make the best of where you are, then that's all you can ask for. Discrimination. Well, that's, <laughs> uh, I also commented on that because when I, there's a picture uh, uh, that I found of the Helen Hay Whitney Fellows. <laughs> When I was, and the, they always have a picture of the third year fellows. So there's this picture of about 20 individual young people, all, you know, how old were we? 20 something. And there's the, the, the president of the organization was Joan Payson, who was in the Whitney family. And, and she was also owned the New York Mets. And she was sitting in the middle. And she was a very large woman, and rather imposing. And she's in the center. Then there, uh, to her right and left, there were, uh, fellows, male fellows, then the second row was all male fellows except for me, <laughs> they're sort of over on the side. And look, uh, so I was the only the woman in that, on that picture. Now there were a couple of, I think there were a couple of other fellows in other years, but it was very unusual. The most amazing part is I didn't find it unusual because in all my years of doing math, I mean at Harvard I was the only woman. In all of my classes I came to MIT, I was the only woman. Uh, this was just the way it was, and I didn't really question it. Uh, I didn't know why there were not women. I said, well, women just aren't interested in math, or they're not interested in these things. Um, when I applied, at, when I was interviewed at Yale, I, I think it came up how many women there were. And there were, the, the Yale class was 80 at medical school. There were always four or five women. Uh, and I asked why that was, and I was told by the admissions person that it was because they, they were very anxious to have women. There just weren't more qualified women. And uh, I said, OK. Yeah, you know. So then when I came here to MIT, there were virtually no women on the faculty, let, let alone uh, in the biology department. And that, again, didn't surprise me very much. Um, and then in about the early 70s, a couple of graduate students, one of whom was Sonia Gutermann, and there was another one. And I remember the moment exactly because I was standing on a box, a wooden box, uh, in my lab, loading a sample on an amino acid analyzer. And these two graduate students came in and said, they said something like, well, thank you for being here. And I said, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I was, when I, I put down what I was doing, I said, why are you thanking me? And they said, because you're a role model. And I had never thought about that. This was the beginnings of the women's movement uh, in the early 70s. And I then began to think about it. And I said, yeah, it's really strange that there are so few women. Uh, uh, I mean, I can't be such a freak. There must be other people who are interested. And, and why is that? And then, of course, uh, things began to change slowly. But um, it was just, I, I didn't think it was, I just didn't think about it. I'd accepted it because that was the way the world was. Just as you, one accepted the fact that at Swarthmore, when I went there, there was a quota for Jewish students of 15% max and a quota for Quakers of 15% men. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I used to, you know, and this was discussed, and it was thought that this was a perfectly proper, proper thing to have. Because uh, I remember being told, well, if we didn't have a quota, we would be overrun with, with Jewish pre-meds from New York. And uh, the answer to which might be so. <laughs> yeah. 
But that was the way the world was then, too. Uh, and you didn't think it was right, but you, you know, not, if you weren't a, a rebel inborn, which I really wasn't, I just accepted it. And so I couldn't go to Princeton while well, I went somewhere else, you know. Oh. I, I should mention, yeah. I'd like to mention, uh, the role that Lisa played in the department when she, right after she arrived. She was in charge of the amino acid analyzer. <laughs> and if you needed, if you needed to uh, get an analysis, you had to see Lisa and uh, work with her. And uh, that was, uh, uh, you, you did remarkable things uh, allowing uh, for, for other people yeah. at that time because that was the only amino acid analyzer in the department. And a lot of people uh, needed to uh, have analyses. And you, you had to deal with Lisa. If you did. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that was too hard. I used to try to price it so it wouldn't be too expensive. But I have a feeling that it wasn't necessarily good for my research. <laughs> it's quite a lot of trouble keeping that analyzer going. Um, it wasn't for, probably wasn't good for your research, but it was good for everybody else's research. <laughs> yeah, we had that analyzer for quite, quite a long time. Uh, it was fun. I, was, I enjoyed sequencing proteins because it was, um, well, people, you know, Julian used to sequence proteins too. Uh, not too many people. Uh, I inherited an old analyzer from Vernon Ingram. And I, the other thing I, I guess I didn't realize when I came here was I, I didn't, I didn't realize you should ask for equipment. I didn't know anything about jobs. I didn't even, I don't, as I recall, I ne was never really paid for my trip from England because I, nobody asked me about it and I figured I was gonna see my mother anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I teased Jack about that many years later. <laughs> but uh, so I had this rather old analyzer initially, which wasn't very easy to run. <laughs> and, uh, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, we, uh, nowadays, well, sequencing proteins, it's, it's sort of like a puzzle. You get a little peptide here, and you get a peptide there, and then you have to sort of sort it, fit them all together. So it was kind of that kind of a challenge uh, appealed to. Uh, and it was um, a lot of work uh, involved. I mean, just unbelievable now when you zip through a DNA sequence and <laughs> get the bread. People just, you know, who have never labored over sequencing a protein, one, one of my projects here when I, in the first few years, was we accidentally found that a crystallizable myeloma, that is an immunoglobulin protein, which had been x-ray structure, which had been figured out, we were trying to study this for various reasons. And it turned out after quite a long time, we found out that it was abnormal. It had a deletion in the middle of the heavy chain, just where this so-called hinge region is supposed to be. And it took us a very long time to find that because we had to sequence in the middle of this 50, you know, uh, 500 amino acid polypeptide. It wasn't at the end. There was no way to get to it easily. So it really literally took years of effort till we finally found that, that the car corresponded exactly to the hinge region. And just as I was writing this up, um, after an embarrassing science, especially my science, moved a lot slower in those days. Uh, so it really was a few years. I couldn't understand why this protein had this deletion. And it was just then that the gene structure of, immuno, of antibodies had been found. And some, uh, somebody in Tanagawa's lab in Switzerland at the time found that there was a little exon exactly encoding the piece that was deleted. Uh, and that, of course, then made it possible to put a, write a reasonable discussion <laughs> in the paper. Yeah. Um, from the people that I've talked to, they all seem to have that one moment or one experience, either in their childhood or in their college career, uh, where you, looking back, you say, that was the moment that I can point to that instance where I got really excited about science or I got really excited about um, my future and that foreshadows uh, where you've come and what you've done. And can you kind of give us a little insight into yeah. maybe one of those instances? I don't think I had an a epiphany of that sort. Uh, uh, um, I think I just was always interested in math, and I was always interested in science. I think, I'm sure, it had something to do with uh, my family background. Not, I, there were no scientists in the family. It was a doctor, maybe. My aunt had married one in Vienna. But um, 
but the, my, the family admired scientists. I sort of heard about, you know, my, my grandmother was born in Poland, and I heard about Madame Curie endlessly, uh, and she was very proud that she was a woman, and my grandmother had sort of come at a time when things were li being liberalized in Europe, and she, I heard a lot about this. So, um, you know, in Einstein, we actually had a family friend who knew Einstein's secretary, and I was promised while I was in high school that I was going to be taken to meet Einstein. It never quite happened, but uh, <laughs> so these were the uh, so these were the people who were admired. It wasn't uh, you know wealth or it was uh, knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge in particular. So I think uh, that prepared me kind of, and then I. The other thing I realized in high school was I thought that the, the teaching of science and biology was very good. We, in fact, with Mandana, we've been the head of the science department, biology department at, at Forest Hills High School. By the way, Lubert Stryer was a student a few years after me at, at Forest, same high school, and he dedicated at least the first editions of his textbook of biochemistry to this man, Paul Brandwine who was the head of a very interested, very influential teacher of uh, secondary students. And uh, he was very, very good at suggesting projects for students to do for this, to compete in this Westinghouse science uh, uh, competition, now sponsored by Intel, I think. But, um, and uh, he's, uh, he, we're, we're, he wrote a book about uh, uh, laboratory uh, approaches to uh, biology and and I have been trying to interest some of the secondary school teachers around here to, to update this book, which is quite a good book, but now badly out of date. That project is moving slowly, <laughs> I think. But uh, so he was uh, very interested in, in education. So we really were influenced by these people. And there were others too. The head of the math department was, I had wonderful, wonderful math teachers. I mean, we had, they were always giving me special hard geometry problems to solve, or we had a math problem of the week, you know, that, that you could work on. And, it was so satisfying, you know. You got the problem, you sat down, and you solved it, or you didn't solve it, and then you had this f this flush of pleasure at having finding, and you knew it was the solution. It wasn't ambiguous. It was clear. Uh, uh, there's just uh, almost nothing like it, really. Uh, but I had the feeling at the time, and I was not one of these people who could. I think I could have gone into, you know, any some other subjects. I could have become. Uh, some other thing. It was, and I had realized at the time that if the other teaching at high school had been at that level, I, you know, it would have been great because I felt I could learn almost anything. Um, so I don't think there was any moment that I said, ah, I will be a scientist. It was just a gradual sort of thing. Um, yeah. There's a picture of you in the tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peter, uh, yeah. Can you uh, mention what that the was? The tea, about? yes. <laughs> Uh, New York has uh, Miss Subways, <laughs> and, and uh, so on. So, uh, Phil Robbins, who was in this department and is uh, now uh, became emeritus and is now teaching, I think, at uh, BU, called me one day. This was in the just after the tea Kendall's tea station had been changed, and said, "Congratulations!" And I said, "Why? I didn't know that I'd done anything particular recently." <laughs> anyway, and he said, "Your picture's in the tea," <laughs> and I said, "Really?" <laughs> So, of course, I hurried over to look, and uh, uh, it just appeared there. It's on the outbound platform, <laughs> about two car lengths from the turnstiles. In fact, there are two pictures. There's a, a regular picture there, and then at the very, very front of the outbound side, there's a negative of that picture, which is less obvious. Uh, it was just, uh, it was, I'd been teaching 702, or whatever it was called 702, some 10 years previously. For, I didn't teach it very long, just for a year or two, perhaps. And uh, one of the experiments at that time was doing uh, an octolony analysis, which uh, was done in a little Petri dish with uh, looking at antigen-antibody combinations. And that was one of the experiments. And I was, and a photographer had come around photographing random things around the department, I guess. And he happened to have snapped a picture of a student and me looking at one of these plates and looking up like this. I completely forgot about it. And uh, it, but apparently when they were sort of trying to do things about the history of MIT, they were looking through files and they came across this picture in some file and decided to put it on the, uh, on the wall. Uh, they didn't have to ask permission, I guess. I mean, I was all right with me, I suppose. <laughs> uh, some people get famous one way and some another. <laughs> uh, but, but, um, 
uh, because I'm. A lot of money by suing them. <laughs> yeah, I think as I was told, at least someone has told me that because I'm not identified, it was okay to to use it. Uh, so anyway, there it is for all eternity, I guess. And now I'm very happy that no one has painted a mustache on it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Graham. <laughs> you alluded to playing in the orchestra, and ever since yeah. I've known you, you've yeah. just been so deeply involved in music, playing with musicians, with, with scientists, and with lots of other yeah. people. I just wondered if you'd say a word or two about what that's meant to you. Well, it's meant a lot to me, and I guess, again, it was family in influence. Uh, and there are a few epiphanies in music. I, my grandmother, whom I was very close to, and I, I, my mother was working, so. It was to grandmother that I went every day after school and so on. And uh, she loved music, and she uh, had an old-fashioned Victrola with a you know turntable, 78 records. And uh, uh, I was interested in, in uh, playing the violin particularly. And, and one day when I was about 12, which is rather late to start the violin, my mother just gave me a, well, my mother went to Wurlitz at the music store in New York and just rather randomly bought a violin and gave it to me. I still play the same violin. <laughs> I do have replaced the bow, uh, but uh, so I took lessons, and uh, I, I remember there are a few pieces of music. I remember hearing the Brahms Double Concerto at my grandmother's when I was 12 or 13, and I was just knocked off. It was so beautiful, uh, uh, the, particularly the second movement, and uh, um, so I took, and that was one of the reasons I was so busy in high school. I had to uh, eat lunch during orchestra. Um, and I've uh, always enjoyed music, and I've played for many years with uh, Graham's wife, Jan. We played violin and piano. And there's another odd thing. I mean, ma a lot of mathematicians um, uh, are musical, and one of my best friends is uh, one of the major math teachers here at MIT. We were at college together, and that's where both he and I started to play chamber music, because the chair of the math department at Swarthmore had, it was a wonderful uh, thing. He had every Monday evening, he had an open house for any student who wanted to play chamber music. And he, he kept the college's collection of uh, scores. Uh, and he had a specially built living room, I think it was a college-owned house, that could accommodate two pianos uh, without sort of taking up the whole living room. And so every, you, know, you don't have to sign up, you just went over there with your instrument and he would you know, who, depending on who turned up, he'd come up with some combination. And many people I, <clears throat> I knew from college would start started their uh, experience with uh, chamber music in, in that setting. I, it was just a, a wonderful thing. And, and uh, the friend is uh, Arthur Maddox. Some of you students probably have uh, had him for one class or another. And we, uh, uh, so uh, that that's a wonderful hobby. And um, I don't play enough these days. Mm -hmm. Um. Lisa, how, how did it happen that uh, Jack got in touch with you? Yeah, it's sort of an interesting story, actually. It was, I was reminiscing about this when I, when I wrote to uh, Elsa after Jack died. I was recalling my initial contacts uh, with Jack. When I was in England on the postdoc, I uh, never w thought very much about the future, really. I just kind of did what seemed sort of reasonable, but more than a year ahead, I didn't really think. So people began to tell me as my second year started that I really ought to be thinking about a job. <laughs> and it was difficult because I was in England and I wasn't planning to stay there. And it was a little hard to make connections. And, uh, and I went to a meeting in Cambridge, England. And uh, at lunch uh, that, at that meeting, uh, there were a lot of American postdocs. The Cambridge, the Mamar C lab there was just flooded with Americans, some of whom <laughs> came to this department, uh, Harvey and John King and probably some others. And the conversation was at lunch was mostly about jobs uh, in the States, where there were jobs. And somebody, I remember hearing somebody say, well, the biochemistry group at MIT had an opening, but Jack Buchanan would never hire a woman. That was, I didn't, I, that was, though you heard those comments very frequently, whether or not they were true, but you did hear them. In fact, I think I heard that about Herman, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, well, I didn't do anything further about it. Uh, uh, but the, a while later, Vernon Ingram turned up uh, in Porter's uh, uh, department. Uh, and what had happened was Jack had been on sabbatical at the Salk Institute. And there he had met uh, two people who were prominent in the field of immunology at that time, Ed Lennox and Mel Cohn. And uh, I guess they had convinced him that this was an interesting area uh, and that uh, 
and Jack began to think, well, maybe we, MIT should, the department should have somebody in this area. So Vernon would periodically go to England because his family was there, I guess, or for other reasons. And so he came to see Porter and um, discuss with him that possibility. I think they actually, the initial idea was if Rodney Porter himself would come to MIT. Rodney Porter, however, did not wish to leave England. <laughs> uh, and uh, then the next in line was probably a chap named John Sebra, uh, who was uh, a sabbatical visitor, a bit younger than me, but way ahead in terms of scientific uh, uh, standing at that time. But John had just moved from Florida to Johns Hopkins, and so he wasn't interested in, in a, a new job. Well, the next in line <laughs> happened to be me. <laughs> So that's really how it came. And the other, the other thing I can tease Jean about on this occasion, or the other thing Jack, uh, I mentioned in the letter was, uh, Jack loved to tell me for years afterwards that his, his, the people in his lab had enjoyed my seminar. And I'd actually talked about the work I did in Herman's lab, except that my skirts were too long. <laughs> in those days, I guess I was still wearing skirts, and it was kind of the time of the new look when mini skirts were the rage. <laughs> and I, I was sort of not, never, never being a fashion plate. I was <laughs> <laughs> Jack would tell me for years he would talk about me. <laughs> but the other thing I remember from that interview was that I met uh, a friend from medical school, or not a close friend, but someone I was who had a small class, I knew everybody, who was in Boris's lab at the time. Um, Ed Kaminskis uh, was a postdoc with Boris. And I was surprised to see him. I, I, you know, I hadn't seen him since medical school. And I, we had tea in that room on the third floor uh, of the uh, building uh, 56, I guess. Uh, and uh, at tea, I, I met him. It was just before the seminar. And I introduced him to Jean. And I said, this is a, a f someone I know, a friend from medical school. And Jean said, oh, you went to medical school? And I said, what is this? I'm being, uh, being uh, asked about a job. And I haven't studied my CV very carefully. <laughs> you didn't know how the, how the department operated in those days. <laughs> these turkeys. <laughs> a young faculty member in those days in the department didn't have much clout. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so Buchanan did hire a woman. And uh, they were, I was rather apprehensive before coming. I mean, MIT has such a reputation, you know, in the world. And I, uh, I you know, I worried would there be women's bathrooms? <laughs> I, uh, I guess I didn't really think that there were a lot of women working there who weren't necessarily either students or faculty. But uh, they were virtually, uh, there was someone named Emily Wick who was in the Department of Food Science. And she left uh, a year or two later to become a dean at Mount Holyoke, I think. And she was on the faculty. And Millie Dresselhaus may have come the same, about just about the same time, but I think those were that that was the only people in the entire faculty. Uh, so we've come, you know, we may not have gotten uh, to the end yet, but we've come a long way in terms of. Uh, uh, and of course, it was just about a few year, a few years later that the uh, number of women at MIT uh, students increased so dramatically. And now in medical schools, I think there are usually more women than men at most medical schools. Uh, um, what was the percentage of women students when you came? It was very low, 15% perhaps, uh, something. I mean, it was McCormick also getting the dormitory for women that also increased, which was relatively new then. Uh, At least I think Jack took a lot of pride in the fact that he hired you. Yes, he did, I and, think. And yes, Schimmel, yes, and Paul, Paul Schimmel arrived history. just about the same time, yes. Yes, he did. He was uh, very good to both of us, always. Uh, uh, of course, I met many other people at that first interview. I met Boris. I remember meeting Maury and uh, Cy Leventhal, I guess, and well, Jean. Uh, all the all the people in the biochemistry group, Vernon and uh, Phil. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa. Mm -hmm.